hysterical. Um, these two were just so funny. They were playing and playing. There was another pair off to the side. These little sticks in the foreground, they were picking them up, doing somersaults with them. One was trying to grab them. They had me in fits. <laughs> um, and I've even seen sulfur crested cockatoos swinging in the street on a child's swing hanging from a tree, fighting over who should have the swing. <laughs> so what's different? Sometimes they amaze us with their colours and it's enough that we've got all the rainbows in the, ra in the rainbow lorikeets colours. Then when you see it with a native Karajong tree in the background, it's just mind-blowingly beautiful. But they're not all so colourful. Even our many black and white birds can absolutely amaze us with their beautiful calls. Listen to the, so on the top right, we've got the magpie with the white on the back of the neck and the similar sized karawong on the right with the yellow eye. It's just picking up um, a stick, actually, actually in my garden a few weeks ago, to line its nest. So it first starts with thick branches. Now it must have been up to almost lining the nest because it's got a fine branch. Um, down on the bottom is the peewee or magpie lark, which builds its nest out of mud. Mud lark is its other name. But listen to the grey butcher bird doing duets. So they do theme and variations and the, and the couple call to each other. It's absolutely beautiful. And sometimes they might be right outside your house or in your garden and, and really loud. It's just a delight. So here's one of our honey eaters, the red wattle bird, the big honey eater. And wattle doesn't refer to the flower wattle, but to this little red dangly bit. It's a bit subtle here and it's a bit dark right in the middle. Can you see the red wattle bird? Delicately getting nectar from a tiny grevillea. Now, if you look at the face between the eye and the beak, there's no yellow. Now look at this other one, please. Where's the yellow? The yellow's on, on the underside. So why is it the red wattle bird when the most prominent color is yellow? But look at the beak, uh, between the beak and the eye. Can you see gold and yellow? Actually, it's full of pollen. So while we know that the birds need the plants for food, of course they do, as we do, as every wildlife, um, every creature does, the plants are dependent on the wildlife as well. The plants are dependent on the birds, bees, and some of our small marsupials to pollinate. Um, and so that's really something to think about is connectedness. And as an ecologist, it's wonderful when you think, you know, I might get excited about a bird, but you can't think about it in isolation. It's absolutely connected with it. everything around it, from the, the insects it eats to what they eat and the plants, what's in the soil that enables that plant to grow. So as we go through today, if you can try and keep that connectedness thinking, that ecological thinking, it, it really makes a difference. Now here's another same species, red wattle bird, looking rather scruffy. Birds spend hours preening their feathers. They have to in order to fly well, and this one's looking really scruffy. They're honey eaters, but they also catch insects and spiders. Look at this great big spider it caught. Do you think it's bringing it to its tiny chick? At this moment, you can all go, oh, isn't that cute? That's a red wattle bird chick, but no. This one was feeding a very, very different chick. An enormous chick of a coel, a migratory cuckoo that lays its eggs in the wattle bird's nest. The eggs hatch and that little chick will just have an instinct that anything that touches its bottom, it does a reverse push and out go the other eggs. And so this poor wattle bird, <laughs> you can see how its head practically sits inside the coil chick and it will develop into this enormous, beautiful cuckoo. This is a male and they've just arrived in the last few weeks and you're probably hearing this sound. Anybody heard it recently? They'll be declaring their territories. They'll be spying out where the other birds are building their nests. This is the other call and one more call. So these three, three main calls to look out for. And of course, everybody knows our brilliant kookaburras. Um, our local ones feed their chicks at eye level. And so because I'm a keen photographer, 
Um, by the way, uh, sorry, there are, there are very few photo credits on the photos. That's because they're nearly all mine. So the photo credits are only on other people's photos. Um, and so this kookaburra was showing me a wildlife survey of my garden. <laughs> I won't show you all of them. I was tempted. But I actually discovered a, a new lizard species that I didn't know was left in our area at all. You know, so we had four skink species. We had this. We had um, all sorts of insects and things brought. And it was all there. And I could just click away <laughs> with my zoom lens and do a wildlife survey thanks to the kookaburra. Now, up to this point, I've mentioned a few birds. You've seen some of them. And anyone who did the, the fun uh, activity before this talk, the question was, think of the first three birds that are commonly around your house or your area, your garden. Um, and then spend a couple of days, if you can, listening a bit more, listening for more subtle things, looking around a bit more, and then maybe think of three extra species. So if you manage to do that, doesn't matter if you're thinking of it now. The first three that spring to mind, am I right in thinking some of the ones I showed might have been amongst them? Possibly in addition to a bouncy grey honey eater with yellow here, the noisy miner. I suspect so. I'd be really interested if it's otherwise. But now there's something different. We're going to look at some of these other species. What's going on in this picture? What do you think is happening? The kookaburra looks perfectly innocent just sitting there. And this feisty little willy wagtail is dynamically attacking it. It actually was practically hitting it. And I've seen them actually land on kookaburras and other big birds and persistently try to hurt them and bite them to, to scare them away. That's obviously around the nest and nesting time. Willy wagtails are just beautiful to watch. I hope you, you see them sometimes in parks or maybe if you're lucky in your garden. They, they catch insects, they flare their tails, they flit about very rarely still. And, um, You'll hear their lovely call. Can you hear that one? Some people say it's like, sweet, pretty creature, sweet, pretty creature. <laughs> That's when it's concerned about something like a predator. And they're so inspiring that this fantastic artist and designer called Zoe Zarekiewski captured the essence of a wagtail with her artistic pen strokes. If you look at these curves, every little curve with a red dot is a hop. And all this was within a few minutes, each one of these drawings. So it's going hop, 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 hop. And then the big circle with the red is where it paused to flat its tail, wag its tail or flare its tail. And then on it went. And same with this other one. And she's brilliantly captured the essence. And of course, birds have inspired artists. Birds have inspired music. You can think of classical music, jazz, rock, modern, any kind inspired by birds. And they just, and, and art, you know, in, in all its forms, poetry, writings, because um, they're just all around us and just bring us so much joy and inspire us. And here's a really special moment, which Helen might remember. Um, we were doing a guided walk at um, Little Bay. And just a word of warning, even though I have a long lens, I was fairly close to this nest. Now, normally when you're in the bush and you see a nesting bird or not just the bush near, near your home, please don't approach it closely because you might make the bird abandon the nest. In some cases, if it's a ground nesting bird, of course, predators might then follow the scent and might come. In this case, this little wagtail chose to build its nest directly above steps down to Little Bay Beach. And we could have touched it, of course we didn't, but the bird chose to be that close to humans, which is fascinating. And there were two tiny little girls in this group and we sat on the steps quietly and the wagtail sat and sat and of course we thought it was on eggs, but then it went away and brought food and fed its tiny chick. Can you see the tiny little scrawny head probably just hatched? And these two little girls, we were just sitting there in awe of this magical moment right next to us. Here's another brilliant small bird that's in part of Randwick, but not north of here. So this is the Randwick Environment Park. And watch what it does. There's a little video clip here.
if you can hear that sit, 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 that tiny sound, that's the call of the red brow finch. Now, a, a site like this is absolutely magical because north of Randwick Environment Park, all the way to Sydney Harbour, there is no place I know of that still has red brow finches. Even Centennial Park, they used to nest there 30 years ago, lots in the, in the middle of the swamp, in the very north end of Centennial Park, all gone. There are no finches there anymore. Um, and so what we have there in the environment park is magic because you can see them, you can practically trip over them. They're so used to people. I'd like you to think about what's happening in this video. It's gone. Oh, watch, it's back again. Oh, it's all a little bird. Okay, so what, what was happening there, you probably guessed. The bird is seeing its reflection. This is our magnificent, superb fairy wren, da -da, winner of the Australian Bird of the Year announced a couple of days ago, and it's well easy to understand why. This poor male at nesting time last year has seen it, uh, sorry, two years ago, has seen its own reflection and it thinks it's another male and it's fighting it off, trying to fight it off and fight it off. When it went and came back again and again, you could actually see a bit of mist. You could see how exhausted the bird was panting. It's using up a lot of energy that should really be used for the nesting, you know, protecting, etc. cetera. Um, and again, this was at Ramwick Environment Park. So here it is, our magnificent, superb fairy wren. The male with its famous blue is up on the right and it's looking out for safety reasons. It looks out, the male and the female do this, on a high dead branch. Do you know dead branches are really important? A lot of birds use them for perches. You can see this again and again. Um, in the environment park and at South Head, there are a few very prominent dead branches, which I see a species on, and then it's ousted by another one, and again ousted by another one, all in the space of a minute. <laughs> so if you do have some dead branches in your garden, maybe consider leaving a couple because they might actually be important lookouts. So on the left is what looks like a female, but actually the beak is black. So I think it's probably a young male, which look like the females, starting very early to get its, its um, male colours because the males have a black beak and the females have a ginger beak and that ginger mask. On the bottom right is this beautiful chick. Now, in, in fact, it's not that much smaller than the adults in body size. So that's just that I didn't expand the photo too much. But if you see something that looks like a wren but has no tail, it might just be a chick. This one probably just left the nest within a day or two before that. And on the left, you see these beautiful moments. So there's a dominant male and female that have a long-term bond, but they're cooperative breeders, which means that a lot of the family will help raise the chicks. In the case of, of the um, fairy wrens, um, the young males are the ones that stay around and eventually the young females are chased off and they have to go and find another territory to join or start a new a new territory with, with some other birds. Um, but you might have up to say three to seven birds. And because there are more of them, they will then take over. The, although the female does the brooding and the female initially looks after the young, then all of them will feed the young. And the female can go off and start a whole new nest. And they might nest several times in a season. So these moments of, of allo preening, so they preen it themselves, preening each other is allo preening. Birds, especially on the back of the neck where they can't preen themselves. And sometimes you see them close their eyes in blissful moments when they're preening each other. Have you ever heard the call? That's a bit of an alarm call of the fairy wren. Now, even if you don't know bird calls, but if you're alert to where the tiny calls are, then you might stop and wait and then you might see them. So whether or not you identify it doesn't really matter, but if you're alert to the fact that they're there, you'll already have learned a whole lot and you might be open to these wonderful new experiences. Now I've often heard and researchers have found that the male fairy wren 
even though they have this long pair bond and this very, very strong territorial behavior, they secretly go off to other wren territories and they often carry a gift, a little yellow petal, to court another female. In fact, when researchers have found, when they examined the chicks of a particular brood, it turned out that many of them, I think about 74%, are actually from different males. So the female also, sometimes before sunrise, goes off up to seven territories away and mates with another male and pops back. So that's really interesting. But this male might carry a gift. What would a male fairy wren carry? A yellow petal. And even though I'd read about it and heard about it, it was only about a month ago for the very first time I actually saw it happen. I didn't see him with a female, but what he did was he left his group and he looked around and he crossed the road and he zoomed off into another patch and the other ends didn't follow. Normally, if the family moves, they move together. And if one flies across the track, the rest follow. But in this case, well, who knows what he was up to. Now, is one garden enough for a fairy wren? Um, the head of the, the coordinator of the, the Birds in Backyards program at BirdLife Australia, Holly Parsons, did her PhD on fairy wrens and together with two other researchers in Wollongong, they did um, some satellite tracking of a female. In five days, she used 27 gardens. And it looks fairly bare there. They don't look like a particularly bushy area. And so even if you do something wonderful in your garden to help them, and if you're lucky enough to actually have them around, please don't take it for granted that they're thriving or that they're always going to be there because they actually need this whole patchwork, this whole network of healthy gardens um, in order to, to be able to live and to thrive. And as we said, to disperse into other territories for those young females also to find more. So here are some of our other resident birds, the silver eye. Some are resident and some migrate. Can you imagine that? Well, these are all tiny. I didn't say the fairy wren weighs about 10 grams. The body size without the tail is about like this. These are all tiny birds, all of these ones. The some of the silver eyes will go all the way to Tasmania. So small. So some of our pardalotes, the top right, are resident and some migrate through. Same, same with the eastern spine, our delicate honey eater down below. And these white browed scrub wrens, most people don't see them, but you might hear a zip, zip, zip in the bush. And then some, a heap of other interesting calls because they like to hang out down the bottom. And they're often, all these small birds are often together. So where you have a fairy wren, you're very likely to have these other ones as well. These are the silver eyes, a flock of them going over. Now the pardalotes calling. That's the spotted pardalote. And the eastern spine bill. Now we've got these small migratory birds passing through right now. So that recording I played at the beginning um, was actually from Nielsen Park. And included in that recording in the bottom right, this black faced monarch, they've been moving through Randwick and our whole eastern suburbs in the last couple of weeks. Um, the grey fantail up the top middle was in that recording. Um, and uh, uh, all of these, look at this stunning rufous fantail, rarely seen, but they move through. They normally live in rainforests, but they'll pass through our coastal area. So where do they go? I mean, on the way, they need to have a break. They need to get food for energy. If we don't provide them with any habitat, there won't be insects for them to eat and they won't be able to survive their migration. But the more habitat we can provide, Will make a big difference. And so here I've got an aerial photo of most of Randwick from obviously Centennial Park right below us uh, and Clovelly Beach at the top left all the way down past Malabar although I don't have it all the way into Botany Bay but it's most of Randwick. Um, so at this stage Helen I'm just wondering if um, anybody had questions up to this point we might just have a little break. Yeah sure. So we do, we've got a couple of questions, Renee. Uh, so somebody's asked, what do you use to record the bird calls? Ah, mobile phone. Just about every um, phone now has a, a voice recorder. It might be called something different on your phone. 
and the, 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 the quality of them is really good. I think the one I played was very faint because it was sort of through the system and whatever, but some of them have come out really well uh, with a lot of detail. So just use your phone. Brilliant. Uh, so Jill's asked, I, oh, it's more a comment, I guess. I, I do the Aussie Backyard Bird Count every year coming up on October the 18th. I love that it makes me go outside and sit quietly for 20 minutes every day and listen for birds. That's fantastic. And thanks for thanks for reminding me. I've actually got a thing like about that at the end. The more people who can participate, the better. Um, if you get the app, uh, and I'll, you, I'll put up the link soon, um, it also has identification uh, aids there within the app. Um, and it's wonderful because what happens then is, and, and my next section is actually about the data. So then the thing is that the data from the annual bird count already is giving them big amounts of information. For example, that fairy wrens uh, seem to be reported less often in just a few years in open areas in just a few years since it started. Um, but also some, some things might be reported more often. Um, now this is once a year, but if you're prepared to do it in your garden or your favorite spot more regularly, then the BirdLife Australia database called Bird Data, which I'm about to show you, is brilliant because everybody's information is useful and it can be used for conservation, for advice to government when it's all bunched together, thousands of people all over Australia, and I'll show you that in a moment. So we have a question about the... We, from Robert, we have too many non-native pigeons as well as others, e.g. natives like Willy Wagtail. So what are the safe ways of, for Willy, et cetera, to get rid of the pigeons? Um, it's very tricky. <laughs> it's very tricky. The best thing you can do is create habitat to encourage the other birds. Um, Pigeons, introduced pigeons in themselves can be a problem. So I'm not sure if you mean the introduced pigeon, I think you mentioned, not the crested pigeon. Got our, our own beautiful native crested pigeon. <laughs> uh, but I think you meant the introduced one. Um, sometimes they can, they're not actually very healthy to have around, unless they're just sitting on your wires, etc. But if you have a wee wagtail in your garden, that's absolutely brilliant. And planting habitat for the other small birds might then succeed. Yeah, so that was a question too about um, attracting birds to your garden. So you'll be getting, yeah, but you'll be covering that soon, Renee. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So another question from Monique was, um, where's Monique's question gone? <clears throat> oh. um, oh, sorry, Carl, how can we supply birds with a water feature where the water won't go stagnant? Um, yeah, so I'm going to show, show a couple of different uh, um, bird baths, ponds and so on. Um, it, it is really important to refresh it. So um, some people just have a basin on the ground or a bird bath on a pedestal that you can literally just gently lift and tip over and refresh. Um, I actually do mine with a, with a blast with the hose. I kind of blast out, you know, the previous day's water, which then waters the plants behind it and then gently fill it again. Um, but it is really important to clean it, but not with any chemical cleaners, you know, just to, some people occasionally might scrub. Um, I just use a blast of, blast of water, but um, no, uh, yeah, that's very important to keep clean water. Okay, so Mark's asking, do birds change colour with the seasons for camouflage? Interesting question. Uh, yes, so, oh, well, around the world, there are species that do that. I mean, famously, there are, there are grouse in the snow that are totally white in winter and then brown in the summer. Um, ours, so we've seen with the wrens, for example, that plumage, oh, I didn't mention, sorry, that the plumage changes seasonally. So most of the males will lose their brilliant blue colors in winter um, and they will molt into a very gray brown, a bit more like the females, but not with that mask. And they just keep their brilliant blue tail. So it's fabulous. Sometimes you think, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of females. And then you look with your binoculars and, oh, my goodness, there's a glint of brilliant blue. And you realise it might be, you know, two or three males in eclipse plumage, it's called, and, and then some females. Um, the older they get, the longer they retain the, uh, the uh, breeding plumage. And some of them, it seems, go directly from one blue plumage to another blue plumage. I think they're, they're much more mature, certainly over five years old, I think. Wow. 
Oh, so some, uh, Louise is asking, what type of camera are you using? Oh, you said um, your phone, but, it, but um, uh, no, so I, I use, <laughs> I'm, I'm using an SLR, uh, a digital SLR, which is um, very heavy and very big. It's a 100 to 400 zoom lens. Um, it's a Canon. People who use other brands swear by the other brands. The problem with this one is it's incredibly heavy. And some of the newer digital cameras with their lenses have really pretty well caught up. And so if, if weight is an issue, I would look into the newer ones. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's a bit of a commitment. <laughs> yeah, okay. And it's a big joy too. Oh, fantastic. So Kim's asking, uh, pigeons start nesting inside my garage. Please advise what should I do? Oh, um, if you're talking about rock doves, in other words, the introduced pigeon, it's probably a good idea to contact someone to help you remove them, but you need to be sure what they are first. If it's a native one, I think it's unlikely to be a native one. Um, you wouldn't want to interfere. <laughs> uh, if, it's a, if it's a rock pigeon, it's probably not that great to have them around. Um, there is, I, probably, I don't know if I should do sort of, you know, advertising, but there is a company called Systems Pest Management, which are the most ecologically minded, careful, uh, the, the fact they talk about management and not, you know, not killing things straight away. They'll use the least dangerous methods, the most physical methods possible for any control, and they'll be able to advise you. Okay, fantastic. And Zosia uh, has asked... Uh, I have a pied currawong who comes to see me at my balcony looking at me, so cute. What do you suggest to do? Uh, well, you know, all our, all our birds are fascinating, but currawongs didn't used to be here year round. They used to just be here and um, didn't and retreat up to the highlands, I think. Uh, but since we planted lots of trees that have fruits over winter, they stay out down here and now they breed and they dominate and they're actually incredibly voracious. So one currawong raising its chicks might need to eat the equivalent of about 40 superb fairy wren clutches in order to raise its chicks, and they do eat them. So um, I wouldn't hurt it, but if you can encourage, if you can plant habitat to encourage other birds, that would be great as well. So I think um, we might move on. Is that yeah, sure, yeah. Um, otherwise, we'll run out of time later. Yeah, so yeah, there'll yeah. be more time for questions at the end. So when we look at Randwick, we can see amazing. Look at all the green areas. We've got fabulous Centennial Park here. Um, we've got a little bit over near Cloverley. There's a fantastic headland with a small patch of bush that's full of small birds. And up to the top right of the screen, there's the whole Maroubra Malabar headland, which is absolutely incredible. And I'm actually going to highlight a couple of areas. That's the oval on top. And the more circular one is Ramic Environment Park, which I've mentioned and you'll see more about. Uh, and further around, of course, it joins on with the National Park. Um, the race course, all of that will have changed since the tram was done, but um, I can't see a lot of biodiversity there. They did do some plantings, but not all green spaces are created equal. And when I do surveys of small birds, around the whole eastern suburbs or other areas, so many of our parks pretty well have nothing, really low biodiversity. But most of the councils, Ramwick and Waverley and Wallara, are all doing incredible habitat connection and creation projects and also coordinating with each other. But look how much of our space is taken up by our houses. It's what we can do in our own patches. If you live in an apartment block, you've often often got a garden around it um, and if you just have a balcony there's so much you can do because a lot of our beautiful native plants are brilliant in pots so there's a lot we can each do okay so this is bird data that i mentioned bird life's database and it is such fun to use i encourage anyone to have a go because you don't even have to be a member you can do a free login but even without that if you go on the top third from the right, not the very top, but just above where it says species list, explore. You can go explore and look at anything. So it starts with the whole of Australia. The dots represent where surveys were done. Most of them will be red, but the, the blue 
means they were done in the last two weeks. So let's say you wanted just to know what's just been seen in the last two weeks, you can look for that too. Now I've selected on the left, local government area, and you can select in different ways, or you can just zoom in, or you can create a polygon around your block and see if surveys have been done there. So this is just showing surveys done in Randwick anytime. And it's got 314 species. Whoa, that's huge. But many of them are water birds and many of them are seabirds because lots of the lookouts are fantastic for finding all sorts of common and rare oceanic birds. Today, we're going to concentrate on the terrestrial birds, which of course is a much smaller list. Um, it's initially listed taxonomically, which means um, we start with the ducks and the, it's sort of to do with the evolutionary time and the perching birds or passerines are much further down the list. But you can choose on the top uh, under logout to go by order of reporting. And of course, look who's on top, noisy miner, rainbow lorikeet, Australian magpie, Australian raven, big birds. The first smaller one is the welcome swallow, then et cetera, et cetera. So you can find a lot of information from here. The great thing is as well, if you put in your own data, you can retrieve your own data so easily and use it for your own analysis. Um, and then there are projects like the general surveys or the birds in backyards project, et cetera. So using my own data from Randwick, I looked at Centennial Park, three different sites, for example, the set southwest part of the park, the central and the north. What I'm showing is just the terrestrial birds, so not the water birds at all, and apologies to all of them, <laughs> because they're magnificent too. Um, and I've divided it by small species and large species. So you can see on the left, the central and southwest areas have quite a few small species, but the north has one. And I haven't done as many surveys there, so I also looked at other people's data. This, this is just using my own, because when you do it yourself in, again and again in the same place or in different places, you know your method. And, and obviously bird data suggests a method and a 20 minute count is ideal. And a certain size area is also ideal. Um, and that gives science, scientific rigor to, to it. And once you get really good at identifying the birds, your data is gonna be great for yourself to analyze, for helping your local council and for bird um, experts generally. Australia-wide. So now I've looked at the percent of small birds out of all the terrestrial birds. That's the blue bar. Same places, south, central and north. And I just added that, the percentage of surveys with noisy miners. And you can see a correlation. Now I know correlation isn't the same as cause and effect, but so many research studies and direct observations too, have shown that where the noisy miners come in, the biodiversity drops. They'll chase away just about everything. So they're a native bird. We're not talking about the introduced miner. This is our native gray honey eater, the noisy miner. We can't control it directly, but we can create habitat that they don't like and helps the other small birds. Now I'm doing exactly the same thing on the left is the Maroubra South walking track, that oval that I highlighted, from the car park towards the wetlands. Short distance, easy track. It's amazing. We often do our guided walks there with Helen or Natalia. And where I've got REP, that's Ramwick Environment Park. Now, uh, the first one says Eastern Spot. I'll show you that section soon. And the other three are the east, the southwest, and the hub. They're approximately equal sized areas that, that do overlap with each other. And you can see a high number of small birds. It's amazing. And looking at the same thing again, the percentage of small birds as a proportion of all the terrestrial birds, as it declines, you also see the noisy miners going up. The Maroubra South track is unbelievable. The car park is full of noisy miners. And then there's a boom gate where the track starts. And you walk over the boom gate and you'd think there was a vertical wall that says no noisy miners allowed. <laughs> because you hardly ever see them over that boom gate, meaning past that boom gate. It's really, really unusual. Um, however, there are sites where there are a lot of noisy miners and still some good biodiversity, like these 
Ramwick Environment Park, Nielsen Park and so on. And I think the secret is simply there are loads of hiding places, loads of shelter, clumps of sticks, not only bushes, but lots of places for shelter. And here's the famous noisy miner on the top right. Okay, so this is one of these fabulous areas, what I call the Eastern Spot. Ramwick Environment Park, the street is called Baragalang, and where we're standing is pretty well the entrance to the Oval. If you haven't been and you're fairly local, I'd encourage you to, um, so you can. <laughs> uh, and um, there was a massive lantana there. And lantana is a weed. And there were years where people wanted to do projects and ripped out weeds and so on and so forth. But then they realised when they do that, everything goes. All the small birds go, not to return. All the small lizards go, vanished. And so bush regenerators many, many, many years ago realised we shouldn't rip out the weeds when we're trying to create habitat. It's really important because they're so tangled and spiky and so on, they create the habitat. Lots of life is there. What we can do is plant alternative habitat and wait until it grows, becomes very, very bushy and dense, put in lots of other spiky things, and maybe then take a little patch away, little patch away incrementally. And that's what they've been doing here. Um, in this photo, uh, taken by my daughter, actually, <laughs> uh, the, uh, there's even a, a swallow, welcome swallow flying above and a willy wagtail below. I can almost guarantee that if you go there and park your car where those ones are, wait a few minutes, you'll see a willy wagtail. You might see red brown finches right next to the cars or in this strip. And the superb fairy wren attacking the car reflection was right there as well. On the other side, um, in the other open area, this is where the sustainability hub is that, that Natalia and Helen and the whole team work from and that amazing classroom where, where they run courses. And they've created a sample biodiversity habitat garden with this beautiful pond. So there's water available. They've, as I said, incrementally been taking away the weeds and doing these incredible plantings. Now, where all those sticks are, there's a tiny plant next to each of them. Oh, I forgot my little tubes. Just give me one moment. The best thing to do, sorry, <laughs> is plant what's called tube stock. So it's not a big pot plant. If you go to a nursery and say, I'd like some native plants, you'll probably be sold something in, a, in quite a big pot and it's quite expensive and you might be able to just get a few. But the community nurseries, um, and I'll, I've got a link to, to both of them, Ramwick Community Nursery and Indigigrow in the Ramwick area. And wherever you live, if you're out of, out of uh, the Sydney or other parts of Australia, you might have a similar uh, council or community nursery nearby. So they all grow them in these tubes, which are tiny. They only cost a couple of dollars each. And also the results are usually much better over a few years than something you've bought as a big pot plant. Um, and so where these sticks are, that looks like, what, there's nothing there. There is, there's a tiny plant and come back a few months later, come back a year later, everything's thriving and flowering. So as well, um, these acacias, you cannot have too many acacias, they're beautiful. And there are many species for many types of, of habitat. Um, and one year, this magnificent little flycatcher called a restless flycatcher, which normally just migrates through if you're lucky, stayed a whole winter and it was foraging again and again and again above one of these flowering acacias of different species because there were insects everywhere and this was the middle of winter it was amazing here it is again an aerial view so same place this is where the cars were parked um, and there's this bushy area now let's look at the key elements why we know now from the data it's really successful really great habitat lots of birds, here are the key elements. It, there's continuous dense cover to the ground. So can you just put one hand horizontally and another hand vertically? I call that two-dimensional habitat. So many of our parks just have grass and a few trees, nothing else. What we need is to fill in these spaces right down to the ground and you put layer upon layer upon layer from grasses to small bushes to trees diversity of plants to provide food all year round and plants to attract insects in particular. Many of our street plantings are nectar providers. The banksias, they're fabulous. The eucalypts, they're fabulous, but they're all 
mostly nectar providers, you will also want to add ones that attract tiny insects, therefore food, and spiky plants for safe nesting and shelter, clean fresh water, logs, mulch and rocks to shelter insects and small reptiles, and connection, connectivity, because this park, it continues out of my, out of my view here, and joins up in a great big circle. And that is really, really important. Now, if our houses and, and the gardens of shared apartment blocks and everything all around continue to do this, then all of those species wouldn't be isolated. And here are our gardens. The problem is we keep losing habitat. Gardens become oversimplified. Look at this pebbles and yuccas. There's nowhere for the invertebrates, food, shelter. There's nowhere to nest. Now look at the top left. That very same garden became this in just a few years. It's, it's a different angle, I know, but it is the same garden. And you can see the structure. There is, this is actually in Canberra. There is height. There is uh, there are many species, so there's an acacia on the right and on the left, they're different. One's just finishing flowering, one's just start in, in its prime. And there's a third one that um, probably hasn't started yet. And there's water on the left and so on, all those features we talked about. So there's a solution to the problem. Every single one of us can make a difference, creating a rich, diverse habitat. And the Birds in Backyards program has, um, if you look at the third heading along, creating places, there is lots of information for what to do and how to do it. You can even look up your local LGA, your council area and suggested plans. So it's not just about our area here. And the website is down there, birdsandbackyards.net. So now we're gonna look at some example plants from our area, same thing, you're in a different area, you might find different, but we're starting with the ground covers. They're beautiful, native violets and kidney weed, they need a bit of moisture. The pink face is a terrible name for a magnificent flower. <laughs> right now they're flowering, um, is, is frontline coastal. So, you know, if you're right near the edge of a cliff and you get the southerly blast and killing everything else, you look for those frontline coastal plants. Add some grasses. And so we lots of us want a mown section of lawn for kids to play and so on. It's lovely. But if you're prepared to leave some patches, allow them to flower and see, maybe you'll be lucky enough to get finches and rosellas and then some clumping plants. So the spiny mat rush um, is used a lot in street plantings, possibly a little bit overused, but actually it's really important. Um, the second photo next to it shows tiny little frogs in the base of a spiny mat rush, also from the environment park. The one in the middle, the blue flax silly, they're flowering now, brilliant purple with these huge yellow stamens and bright purple berries. And look, Eastern rosellas, in the Centennial Park a couple of years ago were gorging themselves on these. And we hardly ever see Eastern rosellas around our area because rainbow lorikeets overtook them and flannel flowers. So the clumping plants, of course, many of these plants had um, really important uses for indigenous people and still have. So these uh, dianillas and lamandras, the mat rush were really uh, for weaving, weaving baskets and so on. Um, and also an important food source for carbohydrates. Wonderful. Now we're going to the low bushes and the medium bushes. Bottom left is the coast rosemary. Looks does look a little bit like rosemary. Comes with a free fairy wren. It shows you they really like it. And then prickly moses. So these are small prickles. They're not too bad. Like if you've got an area where kids are going to play, they're not really going to be hurting the kids as some of the other spiky ones might. So you would put them in a different section. Look at the native fuchsia and the colours. The butterflies come to the pinelias and now taller bushes as well, just full of colour and life. These are all local native species. So this, the, the leptospermums, the tree, tea trees are fantastic insect attractors and look stunning. The next ones, the grevilleas, a nursery will sell you hybrid grevilleas with great big showy flowers that flower most of the year. Beautiful, but the noisy miners will defend them like crazy because that's sugar for them all year round. The better thing to do is not plant those, please. And instead, we've got quite a few species of local native subtle grevilleas. And if you plant clumps and different species, you'll have flowering at different times. Medium and tall bushes. So rather than talking too much about trees, some of the tall bushes are actually like small trees. 
And again, they're just stunning. The teak bush, the second one, don't worry, does not attract ticks. I have no idea why it's called that. Um, they're flowering right now and they smell like honey. The, the next one, the acacia suaviolans, also has beautiful scents. So that's something you could plant near your entrance. The dagger hakea, wow, that has big thorns. So you have to think carefully where to plant that one. The sunshine wattle, um, we actually have a subspecies that's endangered in the eastern suburbs. Um, and the, the she oak as well has gorgeous little flowers on there. And then join it all together with vines and creepers. Look at the colors of those. Some of them scramble like the guinea flower, the yellow one can also scramble across the ground or climb up a wall. Okay, I never exaggerate, but here's a garden <laughs> that could be improved or it might be, you know, have a few bushes. So the main thing is start with what you've got. And if you find that you've got a weedy patch, and there are a lot of insects and tiny lizards there, don't pull it out straight away. Start planting from the ground up. Using those species or whatever's in your local area is ideal. You, you'll probably have some non-endemic things, some non-Australian plants, that's great too. It doesn't have to only be endemic plants, but if the bulk of it is, it's going to be best suited for your soil conditions and it will attract down the local insects and insect and pollinator populations are crashing around the world um, and what we can do is give them homes give them habitat plant for them here's the dagger hakea the beautiful sunshine wattle and the creepers to bring it all together and you've created such magnificence now that's not all watch it's a bit subtle down the bottom i added some mulch i'll take it away without mulch the soil can dry out there are a few places hiding places for invertebrates here comes the mulch, boom. Look at it, like a warm quilt, cozy, protecting the soil, it's lovely. And you don't have to water as much, it stops the water evaporating. Now we might wanna add a nest box because so many of our animals are dependent on hollows and, um, and the old trees get cut down too much. Some of them become dangerous, but um, on the Birds and Backyards website and another one called um, Nest Box Tales, T-A-L-E-S, is excellent information on the size and different size of the opening and different features to look for in creating a nest box. For example, if you were to create one with a very small opening for Eastern Rosellas, there's a size that an Eastern Rosella can fit into, but not a rainbow lorikeet. So as gorgeous as rainbow lorikeets are, they don't need our help. <laughs> Add some water, a bird bath. Um, my friend Virginia Craney has these fabulous um, photos of her bird bath. And here's a fairy wren already there. And down the bottom, logs. There's a beautiful lizard on the log. It's also showing blue camellia, a great ground cover. And here's another photo of the same bird bath. Look at those honey eaters. They're having a wonderful time. But can you just take a moment to look what other features are in that, in that photo? It actually shows a lot of features we've talked about in one photo. Can you find them? So there's a diversity of plants. There's a plant right near the bird bath the birds could retreat to if there was danger. There's a big old log creating shade and shelter and habitat for invertebrates. And you can see that it works. <laughs> um, there's also through uh, local land services, there's this great scheme which can show in different situations where it's better to put the spiky things and where it's better to put the, um, the softer ones and the ground covers, et cetera and all these other features we've mentioned down the bottom. And, um, and here it is, the link to the bird count. So I really, really hope you join the Australian Bird Count on the 18th of October, coming up very, very soon. It's a lot of fun and you can learn a lot and the uh, coordinators can learn a lot as well. Um, here's the Birds in Backyards link again. I really encourage you to go to that website. You can get help identifying birds. You can hear their calls and learn their calls. There's even the top 40, <laughs> top 40 bird calls. Um, and here's the address of our two local endemic uh, indigenous plants. They don't, own, both those nurseries don't only provide local native plants. So you might want to find out what's, you know, what's what and what's good. If you've got a boggy garden, if you've got a shady garden, if you've got a tiny garden space, it's possible to create something brilliant. Uh, in fact, I have a photo outside the PowerPoint that I might show you of a brilliant garden created in a very tiny space. And the second nursery is in Digigrow, which is a fabulous Indigenous enterprise at um, uh, uh, La Perouse. 
um, where the local community are actually collecting the seeds and cuttings as Rabbit Community Nursery does from their own local area. And Indigigrow is also teaching the young people how to do the propagation and all the other things, um, aspects of it. And here's our beautiful fairy wren again in its created garden habitat. You can see diversity in the background. And the thing is, you've, you began with the joy of birds. We began with the joy of birds today. And I hope that they do bring you much joy. And that then once you've created some habitat, it's not only just gonna be the joy of the birds, it'll be the joy of what you've created and find places for yourself to sit and relax and enjoy it. And I hope you succeed. Go back to the red. Yeah, uh, so Renee, did you want to answer any more questions at this point? We've uh, got um, a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure, if, if people want to, sure, I happily. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions around uh, the noisy miners, uh, Rebecca, um, and Kate and Will and Monique, um, that they're saying that they've got what habitats are favourable to not have noisy miners and um, that they've seen, um, Kate and Will said that they've seen native birds, um, no native birds after three months in a garden, what can they do to restore the balance? And um, so, yeah, so the noisy miners seem to be a, a, a problem. So as I mentioned, we can't control them directly. Um, some research problems, just so you know, they've actually formally been declared a key threatening process, uh, but that doesn't mean they're still a native bird, they're protected. The best thing we can do is create the dense habitat because noisy miners don't like it. They actually don't like it. Um, the place I mentioned at Clovelly North, it's just a little headland with a, a small isolated patch of bush, noisy miners all around in the streets. And I've been doing quite a few surveys there because it's full of fairy wrens and New Holland honey eaters in particular, not much other small bird diversity, but oh, and, and scrub wrens, white browed scrub wrens. Um, I don't think I've seen a noisy miner there. And yet they're a few meters away at its narrowest point. They don't like low dense bush. And even if they do come and they might land in trees above it, they will try to penetrate but if you've got some spiky plants and if you bring your density right down to the ground level with overlapping you know different plants then they're very much less likely to come in and even if other birds or lizards are there they're much less likely to be uh, to be found and hurt. What about feeding native birds Renee? There's some questions from Robert um, about feeding native birds seeds, yeah. providing seeds to yeah, attract um, them. Unfortunately, the birds that tend to come and feed them are mostly those big and dominant and aggressive birds or the super successful ones like red bell lorikeets. Um, then they are more likely to keep coming and then they're more likely to keep excluding the small ones. So really the best form of feeding you can do is create the habitat, which then attracts the insects and the little lizards and the little spiders and all of those things. You know, I didn't mention with the, the Willy Wagtail nest, remember that photo with the Willy Wagtail so close up in the nest? It was bound around by spider webs. So when we talked about the interconnectedness of everything, that Willy Wagtail might eat spiders as well as insects. They will eat spiders. And it's also dependent on the spiders for the webs that bind its nest. And mm. it's just symbolic of how everything's interconnected. So the best thing you can do to feed birds is grow plants that provide the natural food and provide them with water and all those other wonderful things. Okay, well, wonderful, Renee. So um, there's many more questions here. Uh, and there, actually there was one comment about from the Kudu Precinct Group who said that they've planted, they're planting a, a habitat down at the end of Neptune Street, which um, oh, is to attract the woolly wagtails. That's great. And yeah, so, um, and the fairy wrens. So um, there's lots of questions here. Is there a website? I mean, you so, showed a website, um, the Bird Life Australia, where they, there's some information. Yes. So I mean, birds is there is birdsinbackyards.net is your yeah. source of so much information. It's just absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And if you're interested in plants, um, Ramit Council's website has a list of native plants available at our nursery, which will be opening soon as well. So, um, and... Okay, so we might wrap oh, this up now. 
Um, oh. I don't think this book's available anymore. There are many sources of plant knowledge, but it might be available in a library. It's absolutely wonderful. It's it well used on top um, of, about our, our own plants. And BirdLife Australia, the Birds in Backyards program has fabulous resources like um, cards with information on each species, uh, bookmarks about the program and so on. So in normal times when we do guided walks, we can give these things out and give you more resources. Um, and hopefully soon that'll be happening again. And I'd love to meet you out in the field. With yes. The trees, looking up in the trees and finding everything we can. Well, thank you so much, Renee. We uh, do look out for our bird uh, tour, coastal bird tour in January with the Marine and Coastal Discovery Program. Uh, we'll be sending information about that soon. All right, well, thank you everybody for uh, today and joining us today. It's wonderful. Thank you so much, Renee. Um, so, so much um, information you have and uh, such a wonderful educator. Thank you. Uh, so, as I said, that we, Ramit Council, if you want to get involved with um, bringing birds back into our environment, uh, we have quite a few different programs that you can join. Uh, we've got the Perma Bees and Bush Care Program and also another program called Plant With Us, which um, Natalia actually coordinates. And so that's a great program where we're, we're trying to plant out as much of the green areas as we can in Ramwick to bring back our, our habitat and uh, protect our native birds, bugs. It, and um, okay, so thank you very much everybody very much for today and if you would like to give us some feedback we'd really appreciate that and um, Natalia I think is going to put the survey link in the chat okay all right wonderful bye everybody thank you bye